Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you like this episode, please remember to hit the like button and leave a comment or two. Then subscribe and click on the bell to receive notifications of whenever we release new videos. Also, please remember to share them to your social media. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us back to the Kodiak Island Archipelago, to Uganic Island in South Alaska. Uganic is rimmed with mountains that rise to around 2,000 feet in elevation and features a low, broad valley down the middle, extending 16 miles. It is 147 square kilometers of thick alder, willow, and salmonberry bushes, occasionally interrupted by meadows of grass and sedge. This island is host to river otters, foxes, and a couple of hundred Sitka black-tailed deer, but the growing population of enormous brown bears presents the most danger. On Monday, November 1st, 1999, 53-year-old Ned Rasmussen was rifle hunting for blacktails with partners Phil Berna, Lenny Corin, and John Kultula. This group of hunters had been hiking the slopes of Uganic for 19 years together and had never had a single problem with a bear, but when they finally did, it was the worst kind of problem. The hunters had left the cabin they were staying in in the early morning and split up to hunt different clearings. Rasmussen had decided to climb the slope just a short distance behind the cabin, while the other hunters chose areas they preferred. Around 1 p.m. from his hunting spot, Berna saw Rasmussen crest a ridge and disappear on the other side. He had returned to hunting for about 30 minutes or so when he heard a single rifle shot. Rasmussen's two seventy caliber hunting rifle rang out, echoing through the valley, but no shots followed it. Considering that must be a good sign that Rasmussen bagged a deer, Berna put the incident out of his mind to focus on finding a deer himself. A couple hours later, Berna glanced back over toward the spot he'd heard Rasmussen shooting and could see a large brown bear very close to the same location. Berna waved his arms toward Rasmussen's last known location, trying to get his friend's attention. His attempts at signaling his hunting partner went unnoticed, and lacking any personal radios, he didn't have any other choice than to return to the trail. He hunted along the trail until it led him back to the cabin, after about an hour's hike. Now, seeing brown bears was not unusual here, and they'd always seemed to prefer to keep their distance from people, so Berna kept its location in the back of his mind while he continued to hunt toward the cabin. At around 4.30 p.m., Berna had met up with the other hunters at the cabin, and while chatting outside, they heard another shot from the ridge echo off the mountainside. It came from where they knew Rasmussen was hunting, and only a few hundred yards away from where Berna had seen the brown bear earlier in the afternoon. Rasmussen was nowhere to be found, as the hunters scanned the hillside, and neither was the bear. Given our first tendency is to agree with the most positive possible outcome, the other hunters assumed Rasmussen had shot a deer and was packing it back to the cabin. They expected he would be back sometime in the evening, but what they didn't expect was that Rasmussen's situation was much, much worse than they'd hoped for. After a few more hours had passed and nighttime had set in, they picked up lanterns and hiked their way through the alder and grassy meadows, slowly working their way toward the ridge where Rasmussen was last seen. The dark landscape grew more eerie with each step as they searched and yelled for Rasmussen, but got no response. After their search yielded no information regarding the whereabouts of their friend, they each made their way back to the comfort and safety of the cabin. That night, the men didn't get much sleep, still hoping Rasmussen would stumble through the door, burned by a backpack full of deer meat. Rasmussen hadn't turned up by Tuesday morning, and they decided to use the emergency beacon that they had brought with them to alert the Coast Guard. A search team and hounds were brought into the area to find Rasmussen, dead or alive. It wasn't long before the hounds picked up a scent trail on the ridge, near where Berna last saw Rasmussen. While scanning for Rasmussen, Berna was riding in the Coast Guard helicopter when he saw a big brown bear on the ground below them. He could see a fresh bullet wound in its shoulder and a long streak of blood clots matted in its fur beneath the wound. The ominous appearance of the wounded bear cast the absence of Rasmussen in an entirely new light or shadow. Landing atop the ridge, they approached searchers who had found Rasmussen's hunting rifle. Rasmussen had put electrical tape over the end of his barrel to keep rain and debris out of it while he hunted. When they examined the rifle, they found grizzly bear hairs sticking to the loosened ends of the electrical tape. Another one of the searchers hollered as they located Rasmussen's hat lying next to a big pool of blood on the ground. 
The presence of the bear hair in the tape on Rasmussen's rifle barrel indicated that he had shot his rifle at some point, which allowed the tape to be peeled away. Then the end of his barrel somehow contacted a bear, enough to get hair stuck in it. When they found his hat next to the large pool of blood, they knew he was likely the victim of a predictable and horrific scenario. The hounds continued to work the brush, and toward the bottom of a grassy slope, in a dense tangle of brush, Rasmussen's dead body was found. One piece of Rasmussen's equipment that was missing, and was never found, was his backpack. It would be unlikely that he would leave his rifle and hat, but take his backpack after a run-in with a bear. Stringing together the events in the most likely order, Berna heard Rasmussen shoot a deer at around 1.30 p.m., shortly after seeing him crest the ridge. After Berna saw the bear around 3.30 p.m., he heard the last rifle shot fired from the area from which Rasmussen was hunting. The authorities figured that Rasmussen must have shot and killed a deer at about 1.30 p.m., then spent some time gutting and packing his backpack with deer meat before either running into the bear while hiking out or getting ambushed while he butchered the deer. Rasmussen's corpse was flown out to the coroner's office for an autopsy and analysis. The state medical examiner found that some of Rasmussen's injuries had hemorrhaged, meaning that they were older than the fatal wounds that had not hemorrhaged. The evidence presents the likely scenario that Rasmussen was attacked initially, and possibly just before he wounded the bear with his rifle. After the initial attack, the bear may have begun consuming part of the deer carcass, while Rasmussen lay nearby, severely wounded, but alive. It is possible that somehow he got to his rifle and shot the bear in the shoulder, as it ate the deer meat. Whether he shot the bear before it attacked, or following an initial attack, at some point the bear caused fatal injuries to Rasmussen's body, which led to his death within just a few minutes. As for the bear, it was noted to be a solitary bear, and there were no cubs observed near it at any point. It is assumed that the bear was likely a younger boar, but there is no follow-up information regarding the wounded bear. There was no comment on if the bear died, or in what state of health, age, or condition the bear was in at the time of the attack. There was simply no information on the record. Ned Rasmussen was one of the only two people who died in North America in 1999 by brown bear attack. After reviewing the facts surrounding this episode, I'm left with a few questions for you. Did the bear ambush Rasmussen before he shot it, or do you think he shot it after an initial attack? Do you think the bear ate all of Rasmussen's backpack that contained the deer meat, and that is why it's never been found? Would you venture out into brown bear-infested woods to find your friend in the darkest of night? I'm not sure whether I'm brave enough to do that. I would be glad to read and reply to your thoughts, so please post them in the comments section below, and let's talk about it. Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider clicking on the like button and clicking on the bell icon. We'll help you know when we post our new episodes. Posting our video links to your social media profiles furthers awareness, and it's fun. We slashed our prices in our merch store, linked below. So check out the bargains there while you shop. As a member of our human community, remember to adventure bravely and be careful out there, especially in bear country.